Okay, uh, let's get started. We have been talking about estimators so far, and we talked about how to estimate mean of a random variable, how to estimate variance, uh, how to come up with an biased, es unbiased estimate of the variance and the biased estimate of the variance of uh, random variables. And then in the previous class, we also talked about limit theorems. So two limit theorems, one is central limit theorem, um, and the other one was the law of large numbers. Now, Today, I want to uh, talk a little bit about the estimator, trying to uh, give you some definitions. And once I am done with those definitions and understand a little bit more about estimators, then I want to go over hypothesis testing. And hypothesis testing is the major chunk of this course, because all the attack detection happens by uh, by doing some sort of hypothesis test on the system. So, so that's why hypothesis testing is a very important topic and everything we have learned so far is basically leading us to the hypothesis testing problem, understand what are the properties of hypothesis testing problem and then we will study some of the hypothesis tests in the uh, future classes and then we will apply it for attack detection in, uh, in uh, multiple different scenarios. Okay, so, so I have theta, so let me, uh, let me uh, start with uh, the beginning. So I have y, which is a function from omega to r. This is a random variable. We have y1, yn, iid samples of y. Um, we had defined y bar as 1 over n summation y i, i equals 1 to n. Uh, we had defined s square as 1 over n minus 1 summation y i minus y bar square i equals 1 to n. So this was the and there was one another s tilde square, 1 over n summation i equals 1 to n y i minus y bar square. <coughs> okay, so these were the three things we had discussed in the previous class where if you have a random variable, we started with Gaussian because that was easy, but of course these uh, expressions hold for more general situations. So this is the mean of y. Oh, let me write down what we had proved in the previous class. So expected value of y bar is equal to mean mu. Expected value of s square was equal to sigma y square and expected value of s tilde square was sigma oh n, o, n minus 1 over n so n minus 1 over n sigma y square and the variance Variance of y bar was sigma y square over n. <clears throat> so these were the four expressions we had derived in the previous class using the properties of random variables. Okay, so this is in a nutshell what we did in the previous class. Any questions on this stuff before we proceed? Okay. All right. So, so I have theta, which is a parameter of interest.
that depends on distribution of y. Okay, so let theta be some parameter of interest that we are interested in knowing about and that depends on the distribution of y. What do you think would be different parameters of interest which depends on the distribution of y? So there are some obvious ones on the board, so let's get them out of the way and then we can talk about more interesting parameters of interest. So what are the different parameters of interest that depends on the distribution of y? Mean, mean and covariance. So your theta could be mean, your theta could be covariance, mean of y, covariance of y. What else? Sorry? I, I'm not able to hear you. Variance? Median. Median? Yeah, okay. No, median is not, does median depend on the distribution? I'm not sure if median depends on the distribution. Median is an estimator for mean when you could have very large deviations. So I'm not sure if median depends on the distribution explicitly or not. Maybe it does, I, I don't know. Median of some distribution. I am not very sure whether median is something that is uh, of interest or not because it depends on the samples. I'm not sure if median can be defined for the distribution itself or not. So something that I don't know about. So that's why I put a question mark here. Anything else? So we have temperature sensor here and I have IID samples of the temperature. Uh, we have already talked about what could be of interest to us. Anything else that could be interesting to know about the temperature that sensor we have in the room? Very good. So uh, theta could be the max of support. So support of a distribution is the interval on which the random variable takes values. So maximum of support of distribution theta could be minimum of support of distribution. Anything else? I mean, we are talking about all real numbers, but you know, we could also talk about vectors in a similar fashion, but I just want to be very simple right now. So that's why these are all real numbers, but remember that in the future, we'll talk about vector case as well. So we have maximum of support. I want to know what the maximum temperature of this room has been over the past several years. And I want to know what the minimum temperature of this room has been in the past several years. Can the temperature go below 32 degrees Fahrenheit? Can the temperature of this room go above 100 degrees Fahrenheit? I don't know. So that's something we again have to look at the data and we have to figure out whether that can be the case or not. Anything else? Number of samples, Number of samples is something that's sort of given. It's not uh, a parameter that depends on distribution of Y. I think those are pretty much what you would be interested in. Trying to think what else could you be interested in. Yeah, I think those are the main factors. Uh, if you're, sometimes even the distribution itself is not known. So let me give you an example. A few weeks, few, not few weeks, few years ago, uh, we were looking into the problem of um, what is the arrival rate of passengers for ride sharing systems. Okay, so if I look at 
OSU, like the entire OSU area, and I want to know how many people call Uber, what's the distribution of people calling Uber in five minutes interval or one hour interval. Uh, we didn't quite know what sort of distribution we are going to see. Uh, so we looked at New York taxi data because that data is available online for free. And we realized that in high demand areas, the arrival rate of passengers is, uh, is Poisson, okay? So Poisson distributed. This is something that we had talked about when I was uh, telling you about distribution. So in that situation, uh, the people calling for Uber is Poisson distributed. People ordering things from Starbucks, it's also Poisson distributed random variable. So in many situations you see this, you don't even know what the distribution of the random variable is going to be. So you run some test and you try and identify what the distribution is, distribution of the random variable looks like. So uh, you could even be interested, but in that case, uh, the, the, when you're looking at a Poisson distribution, it has only one parameter that determines the entire distribution. So what we were trying to do is figure out what that parameter looks like and whether it's truly distributed according to Poisson distributed or not. So, so those are also tests that you can run, uh, but those are sort of complex parameters, not simple parameters. Sorry? Changing over time, okay, so how things are, how the distribution itself is changing over time. So that's exactly how you detect uh, if you are getting attacked or not, or if, if there is a fault or not. So we will talk about change detection in, in, in a few weeks from now, which is detecting changes in the distribution of Y. That's called change detection. Okay. So I have some parameter of interest that depends on distribution of Y. Now I don't know what this parameter is equal to, but I have samples, I have IID samples. I know, I have looked at the New York City taxi data and I know how many people are calling taxi uh, every hour of the day, okay? For every day of the week. So I have IID samples of Y, or I have IID samples of the temperature inside the room or whatever, like other, other things that could be of interest. So now, I don't know the true parameter, but because I have data, I can estimate the true parameter. So I'll have theta hat, which is n, n is the number of samples. So I have theta at n, that is a function hn of y1 to yn. So hn is some function, and I look at all the samples, and I try to estimate theta hat. I mean, I come up with an estimate theta hat n for theta. <clears throat> okay, so. So this is one, so this is the estimator, this is theta hat n for the mean, this is theta hat n for the variance, and this is also theta hat n for the variance, okay? So I can come up with theta hat n, there are two things we should know. The first thing is theta hat n is unbiased estimate of theta, so this is the definition, so I'm writing if and only if, expected value of theta hat n is equal to theta, then it's an unbiased estimate of theta. So that's the first definition we should know. And let's go back to this example. Is y bar an unbiased estimate of mu? Yes. Is S square an unbiased estimate of sigma y square? Yes. Is S tilde square an unbiased estimate of sigma y? No, right? Because there is an n minus one over n term here. It's not, it, this is a biased estimate. This is an unbiased estimate. Let's look at the second definition. Theta hat n is a consistent 
estimate of theta if and only if the probability of theta hat n minus theta greater than epsilon is equal to 0. When I take limit, n goes to infinity. For those of you who have taken stochastic processes class, this is known as convergence in distribution, convergence in probability and uh, theta hat n converges in probability to theta. But if you have not taken stochastic processes, it's fine. This is the expression. Oh, for every epsilon greater than zero. So this epsilon is a positive number and no matter what epsilon you pick, that expression must hold true. Okay, now let's look at these, again, these examples. Uh, so, so let's consider mean y bar, okay? So y bar, let me call it y bar n, okay? Let me just put n in the denominator so that, sorry, not in the denominator, in the sub, uh, subscript so that uh, we make it explicit, we show explicit dependence on n number of samples. Okay. Is uh, y bar n consistent estimate of mu? Mu is the parameter of interest. Mu is equal to theta in our case. Is y bar n a consistent estimate of mu? In other words, if I let n go to infinity, will y bar n converge to mu with high probability? Is that going to happen why and, and why would it happen so I see some nodding heads why would why would y bar n converge to mu as n goes to infinity which is what this expression is saying yes we have lots of samples yeah, yeah. so the probability of getting uh, like mean uh, mean closer to the Actually, right. will be very high if the data sets are but why would that be the case? There is a specific theorem that is used to show that. What's the theorem? The law of large numbers. Law, yeah. yeah. So last week we uh, sorry in the on Wednesday's class we talked about law of large numbers. What was law of large numbers? It said y bar n converges to mu uh, with very with high probability as n goes to infinity. Okay, so law of large numbers tells us that y bar n would converge to mu with very high probability as n goes to infinity. So that's uh, uh, law of large number allows us to show that this is a consistent estimate of mu, consistent estimator for mu. Now look at s square n. It turns out that this is also a consistent estimate. So as n goes to infinity, uh, s square n would converge to sigma y square. Same thing with s tilde square n. It would converge as n goes to infinity, it would converge to sigma y square because this n minus 1 over n term will become equal to 1 because n is going to infinity. So this term will become equal to 1 and this estimate would converge to sigma y square as n goes to infinity. So typically, when you want to show consistent estimate, then you typically use law of large numbers or concentration of measures. So these are the two, two theory that allows you 
to establish the consistent estimate part. Law of large numbers is something we talked about in the previous class. Concentration of measures is an advanced topic. And if you take uh, advanced uh, topics in mathematics uh, in probability theory, you will touch upon the subject of concentration of measures. It requires a lot of machinery to do concentration of measures. But that allows you to conclude whether the estimator you came up with is a consistent estimate of theta or not. Okay. Uh, yes, please. So, epsilon doesn't have to be small, right? Epsilon can be any number, any positive number. So it has to, it, you can take it small, you can take it large. But does that affect of how good this estimate is? So basically when you, when you write here for all epsilon greater than zero, mm -hmm. it means that all, all it affects is how quickly it converges to zero, how quickly this probability converges to zero. So if I pick epsilon equal to one, it will converge very fast to zero. This probability would converge very fast to zero. If I pick epsilon equals to 0 0.00001, this is going to be extremely slow to converge, right? So, yeah. Any other question? Okay. So I'm interested in the velocity of the vehicle. I have data from the four rotation sensors and I want to estimate the velocity. Uh, you, will, you will sit and think for one week or two weeks to come up with the right equation to estimate the velocity theta hat n using the data that you are seeing from all the sensors. And then you want to make sure that whatever estimator you come up with is an unbiased estimate of the velocity. And it would also be nice if it is a consistent estimate of theta because, you know, you, you want to make sure that as you get more and more samples about the, the information from the wheel sensors, you get a better and better estimate of the velocity. So that's what this consistent estimate means. The more data I have, the better confidence I have that whatever estimate I have made is actually a good estimate of the true parameter. Okay, so it can, you can apply it in many settings. Uh, it could be uh, pressure in a, in a valve and you are measuring, sen you are measuring the different parameters from sensors and you are trying to estimate what the pressure in the valve is going to be. And based on that, you will have to take some actions. So you always want to come up with an unbiased and consistent estimate of theta. That, that's, that's the ideal situation. It's not going to be the case all the time, but, uh, Ideally, we want an unbiased and consistent estimate. Uh, I want to come up with a function hn, which provides an unbiased and consistent estimate of theta. Okay, that would be our goal. Now, uh, of course, this is a 5,000 level, so we are not really talking about how do you come up with estimators. But you know, if you take statistics classes, uh, you know there are entire classes on designing estimators for various applications. Okay. All right. Uh, let me. So it, of this concentration of measures. Yes. How does it exactly tell us that our uh, estimator is consistent? Like. Can yes, it that's a good question. So the question is. How does concentration of measures allow us to show that theta at n is a consistent estimate of theta? So in concentration of measures, you basically try to come up with this bound. So probability of theta hat n minus theta greater than epsilon is less than or equal to, let me give you some exponential minus C2 n epsilon square. Okay, so this would be, there is a concentration of measure result, which shows that the mean uh, minus uh, theta satisfies this expression for some appropriate constant C1 and C2. 
Now, what happens when n goes to infinity for a positive epsilon? When epsilon is greater than zero, n goes to infinity. What does this thing converges to? If I take limit, n goes to infinity. Converges to zero because you have, oh, I forgot to mention, but C1 and C2 are positive numbers. So I have epsilon square, which is a positive fixed number, C2, which is a positive number, and I have a negative n here multiplied by some positive number. So this actually goes to zero as n goes to infinity. So this is a concentration or measure result, which uh, is, I mean, this type of result is what concentration or measures comes up with. The other type of concentration or measure result would be something like C1 over n epsilon square. Again, for a fixed epsilon greater than zero, as n goes to infinity, this right hand side goes to zero, and so you get a consistent estimate of theta. So those are the different flavors of concentration or measure results that comes out in practice. Any other question? Okay. Can I raise this side? Okay. So now I have y bar n is unbiased. So this is something that you should, uh, I don't know, facts. Unbiased, consistent estimate. Y bar n is an unbiased, consistent estimation estimator for mu. S square n is unbiased consistent estimator for sigma y square. S tilde n square is biased consistent estimator for sigma y square. Okay, so these are some of the things that we should know about. Um, and if there are no further questions, I want to talk about hypothesis tests. Any questions so far on this stuff? Everybody understands it? So as I collect more and more data, I get better and better estimate for mu. If I collect more and more data, S square n gives me a very, very good estimate of sigma y square, and the same thing happens for S tilde n square as well. Okay. Now let's talk about hypothesis test. You know, I, l let me, let me before I talk about hypothesis test, let, let me just make a very small remark. Okay, so here we are arguing, and so far in the entire discussion we have been arguing that I have y, a random variable, and I have samples of y, and I want to estimate what the distribution of y looks like, or some parameter of distribution of y looks like. In reality, that is seldom the case. Well, no, in some cases that is the case, but, but in some cases this is what happens. 
I have two random variables, x and y, omega to r. They are correlated random variables. So they have a joint distribution. And I want to measure theta x hat, but I have samples from y. Okay, so I only observe y1 to yn iid samples. So I have some unobserved uh, random variables, so the velocity, and there are four wheel sensors, and I only have information from wheel sensors. That's it. I don't have information about the velocity. But I know that they are jointly distributed random variables. So we want to come up with theta hat x. Uh, I want to put n as well. by using the information from y. OK, so this also happens quite a lot in, in real world settings. Uh, but you know, for some reason, I mean, not for some reason, we will get to it in a bit, because this requires a little bit more careful thinking. But this sort of situation happens. Uh, like I mentioned, you have wheel sensors, you have reading from the wheel sensors, but you want to figure out what the velocity of the vehicle is. And that's the situation modeled by that case. And there, again, you want to have a consistent and unbiased estimate. And you are going to use the properties of joint distribution to show that whatever estimator you came up with is a consistent or unbi and, and unbiased estimate of uh, theta, the true parameter that depends on the distribution of x only. OK. In the above case, theta n, uh, like that's like, uh, looking for the velocity of? Well, in this case, no, because uh, this is a, theta is a parameter that depends only on the distribution of y. Here, theta x is a parameter that dis depends on the distribution of x. But you only have samples from y. You don't have samples from x. Based on based on the observations from Y. Okay. So X could be who is going to be the next president of the US, and Y could be or Y1 to YN could be you know you go around and asking uh, who are you going to vote for, who are you going to vote for, and then you sort of come up with an estimate that hey look I I asked 500 people, this is what they have said. So I think this person is going to be the president of the US with high probability, right? That's what the, I think this is something that happens across the entire world now where they keep doing, the journalists keep doing exit polls and they keep you know, trying to estimate what X is going to look like. Okay. Hypothesis test. So in order to introduce hypothesis test, I first have to tell you what hypothesis means, right? So consider this situation. You are looking at the temperature of five rooms in this building, OK? So you have maybe one room at every floor, and you're looking at the temperature. And this is what you, ha you are seeing. So this is the temperature let's say sensor one and sensor two, and you see the temperature looks something like this, and the temperature looks something like this, and then suddenly it looks like this. What's happening here? So this is the temperature, this is the time. So you're sitting in some control room of the building, and you're looking at the temperature of the building, and you notice this drop. What do you think is, is happening? Sorry? Some sort of adversity sensor might have failed. OK. There might be an attack. So attack, sensor failure. 
Anything else? Suppose it's winter time, which it is going to be winter very soon. Anything else that comes to your mind? So one is somebody attacked the sensor, the other one is there is some sort of failure in the sensor, maybe the sensor has gone bad. Anything else you could think of? Okay, let me write one more hypothesis. Somebody opened the window. Okay, I have an office and I have a window in my office and I could open the window for some reason. Anything else that could happen? I guess I'm, I'm out of ideas. Maybe we are all out of ideas. Okay, so there are three hypotheses that we have. So we have observed something in the data and once we observe something, we have like a few hypotheses and we want to figure out which of the three things is correct. Okay, I want to know what, which of them is correct. Is it an attack? Is it a failure? If it is a failure, I'll go and, I could go and replace the sensor. Has somebody opened the window? In which case, I'll just call up the person and say, hey, look, you know, the window seems to be open. Why don't you close it? So this whole topic is studied under the umbrella of what is known as hypothesis test. So I have data and based on data, I, and I have some hypothesis, and based on data, I want to figure out which of the hypothesis is correct and which of the hypothesis is false, okay? And this happens all the time. You want to start a business. I mean, there, are, there is a Kingsdale shopping center not very far from here, and there are a few empty shops there. And you know, you could go there and you could look around and say that, you know what? My hypothesis is, I think the people here would really like tea, and so I should open a tea shop here, okay? So that's a hypothesis. Um, so whenever you start a business, you have some implicit hypothesis that you want to test in the market. Uh, my, my daughter, she's one year old, and she cries. The only thing she can do is actually cry, okay? She can't really say any words. Now, she could cry for like a million of reasons, and so every time she cries, we have to start running hypothesis tests. Is she crying for food? Is she crying for milk? Is she crying for uh, because her diaper is wet? Or is she crying for some other reason, right? So every time something, some event happens, I look at the data, and I start doing hypothesis tests one by one. And eventually, some of the hypothesis turns out to be correct, and then I take the appropriate action. So for instance, in the case of my daughter, she's one year old, she can only cry, I hear her cry. So that's the data that came to me. It's a binary data, zero, one data. So one means crying, zero means not crying. So I got data equals to one. And then I'm like, okay, I think she is hungry. So I'll give her some food and she will throw the food away. And then I know, okay, she's not hungry. So then I'll give her milk and she will throw the milk away. And then I know she is not, <laughs> she's not looking for milk. Right, so I keep going through this hypothesis test and this is like my life from morning till evening. It's not a good life to be, to have, but <laughs> that's what it is, can't help it. So anyway, that's what hypothesis test is. So now what we are going to do, so now you understand what hypothesis test is. What I'm going to do is I'm going to write it mathematically what exactly it means for running a hypothesis test. Needless to say that you actually do it on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, my wife is angry or not angry, but she says, I'm hungry, I want to eat something nice, and so I have to go through some hypothesis test, do you want to eat Chinese food, do you want to eat Thai food, do you want to eat Indian food, and so on and so forth, right? So I have to go through a bunch of hypotheses to test what is it that she wants to eat. So it's actually something that you do on a day-to-day -day basis, but you just don't realize that you are actually running a hypothesis test at that time. Now the fun thing is, if you become a cybersecurity engineer, <laughs> you will do it at home and you will do it at work. That's all you will do all <laughs> throughout your life. Okay. So hypothesis test. So there are two things, uh, four things in hypothesis test. One is null hypothesis. The second is alternate
hypothesis. So H naught, H A. The third is test statistics. This is your theta hat n. And the fourth is rejection region. So H naught could be theta equals to theta, theta equals to mu. H A could be theta greater than mu, theta less than mu, or theta not equal to mu. And then your test statistics is theta hat n, and your rejection region would be some interval. Let me call uh, 1 infinity minus infinity 1 uh, minus minus 1 1 and so on. Okay, so any type of hypothesis test comprises of these four things that you need to specify or you need to understand. So the first thing is null hypothesis, what you think is going to be the case. Uh, then you have alternate hypothesis, if this is not the case, then what is the other option, right? Uh, that's the alternate hypothesis. So in this case, let's assume that you don't know what the mean of the so let's consider this problem. I have the temperature data, and I think that the average temperature of this room, based on my feelings, is 71 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, that's my hypothesis. So my hypothesis is theta equals to 71 degrees Fahrenheit. Now I could have alternate hypothesis. This is my feeling. My alternate hypothesis is, I think the alternate could be theta is greater than 71 degrees Fahrenheit. So I think the average temperature of the room, uh, whatever the distribution is, it's greater than 71 degrees Fahrenheit. So that's my alternate hypothesis. And this is known as upper tail, what is it called, upper tail? So I didn't, uh, I didn't write it, but I, is it upper tail hypothesis or upper tail? Let me call it, I mean, let me write it upper tail hypothesis, but I'll tell you what exactly it is in the next class. So there is some word here which I'm, I'm missing right now in my notes. I could have theta less than, uh, 71 degrees Fahrenheit, and this is known as lower tail. Hypothesis. And I could have theta is not equal to 71 degrees Fahrenheit, and that is two tail hypothesis. I'm just trying to check, is it upper tail? Uh, 
upper tail test, not hypothesis but test. Yeah, one of them would be alternative hypothesis. Only one. Okay, you have to pick which of the alternate hypothesis are you interested in. So, pick one. So, you can have an upper tail test, you can have a lower tail test, or you could have a two tail test, depending on the application. Then you come up with a test statistic. So, I have data. And I'm going to let theta hat n be summation of yi over n. i goes from 1 to n. This is my test statistics. Okay. Now suppose theta hat n. Now one thing we, we all know that as n goes to infinity, uh, I will exactly know what theta, what the, what the average temperature of the room is. But the problem is I can't wait until my death and your death and everybody's death and until the world ends to get that information. It's just Im impossible for us to wait for n going to infinity. So we have to figure out based on the data from yesterday or data from today, which may be like uh, 48 data points, 100 data points, 200, 5,000 data points, right? So we have to fix n and we, we look at this average and here is the situation. The average turns out to be 70.87 degrees Fahrenheit. So after 5,000, so for n equals to 5,000, so for whatever reason you have 5,000 samples uh, of temperature of this room, and it turns out that your theta hat n is equal to 70.87 degrees Fahrenheit. What are you going to do? Are you going to accept, are you going to say that I think theta is 71 degrees Fahrenheit or are you going to say that theta could be greater than 71 degrees Fahrenheit or alternatively if alternate hypothesis was this, are you going to say that okay theta is less than 71 degrees Fahrenheit. So there is some uncertainty, we are not, n is not one uh, infinity, n is actually only 5000, okay. And after 5000 uh, samples, this is what my temperature, average temperature turns out to be. And I have to make a decision whether my null hypothesis is true or my alternative hypothesis is true. Okay, and that's done through rejection region. So here is what the rejection region would say. So this is what I will write in my MATLAB code. If theta hat n, if yeah, theta hat n is greater than 70.5 or theta hat n is less than 71.5, H naught is true, else H A is true. Okay. So that's the rejection region. I come up with an interval and if my theta hat lies within that in interval then uh, my hypothesis H naught is true. If it's not in that interval then my H A is true. This is my MATLAB code for the hypothesis test. So you are taking that interval from the theta hat n? Yes. 
because this is this is the only thing I can measure. There is nothing else I know, right? I don't. I want to know the true distribution, but there is no way for me to know it. So, okay. So this is your hypothesis test. Now, what could go wrong in this expression? If this is my algorithm, what could go wrong in this algorithm? Can you speak a little louder? See the height between 17.5 and 71.5. So what? Between 17.5 and 71.5. Right. So, so let's say let's say my theta hat n was 70.87, and I have mentioned that h naught is true. Uh, do you anticipate there could be a problem with that conclusion? So this is what I've concluded based on my test. Uh, do you think there could be a problem with that conclusion? Yes. Why? Because we have only 5,000 sample points. Yes. And like we don't know like how many sample points should we be taking. Right. So if if the sample point is like if I would have taken some uh, let's say one lakh sample point. Right. I might have got. Temperature 70, 69 maybe. Correct. Or maybe 72 or 70. That's right. That's right. We okay. Good point. So his point is, I have taken only 5,000 samples, and I got this number. What if I take a million sample points, and the theta hat n turns out to be either 69 or it turns out to be 72, right? And that is exactly the problem. So based on limited amount of data, I made a conclusion. But remember that that conclusion could be wrong. I could have made the wrong conclusion because of the way I have set up my hypothesis test. So there are two things we need to worry about. One is type 1 error and the type 2 error. So let me write that down. And type 1 error is that H0 is true, but based on data, data and test statistics, HA was concluded to be true. And then type 2 error is exactly the opposite. HA is true, but based on data, H0 was concluded to be true. Okay, so because I have limited number of data, data points, I could make a mistake in my hypothesis test. And so I could make a type 1 error where H0, my null hypothesis is true, but because of the data and the way I have set up my test statistics, HA was concluded to be true. And then Type 2 error is when HA, the alternative hypothesis is correct, but based on the data and test statistics, H0 was concluded to be true by my algorithm, by my code. And so the two things that are important in hypothesis test is the probability of type 1 error which is known as alpha and then probability of type 2 error which is denoted by beta.
actually let me call it alpha n and beta n because it depends on the number of samples. What's the probability of making a type 1 error and what's the probability of making a type 2 error? So I'm running out of time so I'll just end here. So in the next class we will look into various types of hypothesis tests and I'll probably come up with a handout so that I can give it to you and you can read some of the stuff uh, later about different types of hypothesis tests. So that's all uh, I have for today. Thank you and uh, I'll be happy to take any questions now.